Welcome to this Good Friday ecumenical service. This is for the entire community, and it is going out uh, live stream on our Facebook page and will also be available later on on YouTube. My name is Herb Anderson. I'm the pastor here at Delisle Community Chapel, and I'm pleased to be joined in presenting this service by my colleagues, Reverend Lindsay Moan of the Delisle Vanskoy United Church, whose contribution has been pre-recorded, and by Roseanne Kilo from the Roman Catholic community. This is uh, a service that will also involve representatives from each of our community churches. I trust that God's Spirit will renew our faith as we share once again the old, old story of Jesus. Let us worship. Our loving Father God, on this Good Friday morning, turn our hearts again to Jerusalem and to Calvary, to the life and death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Stir up within us the gift of faith that we may not only praise Jesus with our lips, but may follow him in the way of the cross. Amen. Long before Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, long before he is arrested and put on trial, long before the accusations started, forgiveness was offered. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he met many people, and as he came to know their stories, he offered them the simple assurance that their sins were forgiven. It didn't matter what they told him. He offered God's forgiveness without strings attached, without condition. It's one of the things that got him into trouble with the religious authorities, one of the reasons they put him on trial, for claiming that God's love was so extravagant, God's grace was so available, that no one could stand in the way. 
Coming to God in confession is one of the gifts of worship, knowing that as we offer our sincere acknowledgement of the ways that we have fallen short, we will always be given that gift of grace. Let us pray. God of life, we come to you in the midst of sorrow and broken hearts. This past year has held so much. We have lost so much. There has been disappointment, frustration, anger, fear, and endless uncertainty. In some ways, we have faced constant change. In other ways, each day has felt exactly the same. We've done our best, and yet we know we have often fallen short. Forgive us, merciful God, for each word spoken in anger, each action done in selfish ambition, each thought brushed with hatred, each moment spent in doubt, each time we turned away from you. As we offer to you now those things for which we hold guilt, we pray that space might be made in our hearts for your grace and assurance and forgiveness to move in. Friends, know this. You are never alone, not on good days and certainly not on difficult ones, no matter what. God meets us in our brokenness. Christ joins in our suffering. The Spirit binds us to one another in our grief. This is the power of God's love for you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath and let this truth fill you, that you are forgiven and breathe out with the relief of assurance. Amen. The Passion of the Jesus Christ according to John. After the Passion of Supper, Jesus Christ, the same disciple of God, God the Father, to a place where there was a garden where he and his disciples Well, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Jesus Christ had the passion of the soldiers to beg the priests and the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing that all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So, if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus, and Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him, First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was very cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. 
Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is this how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Why did Jesus die? It's a question that has been asked for 2,000 years and has been answered in many ways across the Christian faith. Although Good Friday is marked in almost every Christian denomination, our understandings of the significance of the day vary around the world. This morning, I wanted to share a little bit of the United Church perspective. We believe that Jesus died on Good Friday as a direct result of the radical teachings that he was sharing. Over the approximately three years of his ministry on earth, he traveled throughout the region, telling people that they mattered, that they were loved by God, and that they were forgiven. He healed people, and he crossed strict boundaries that were put into place by the authorities and the culture. He spoke to women and welcomed them into his discipleship. He touched people who were considered unclean, and he shared meals with tax collectors and sex workers, people that were considered sinners. He told the poor that they deserved better and taught that a system that was in place that kept the rich and powerful at the top and everyone else at the bottom was a direct contradiction to God's kingdom. And he invited everyone to be a part of creating that kingdom on earth. Well, as you can imagine, this behavior made some very specific and powerful people angry. His claim that he was the son of God was threatening to the Roman leaders because they believed that their Caesar was the son of God, and they didn't like to hear about any revolutionaries that threatened the peace of their reign. The way that Jesus healed and crossed boundaries and showed love and mercy to sinners and women and unclean people made the Jewish authorities angry because they believed that they had control of the temple and the system that kept people in their place. And his talk of the kingdom of heaven where everyone had enough and wealth was shared was threatening to the rich and powerful on both sides because they wanted to keep their positions and their wealth. Jesus was executed by the state as a revolutionary and a criminal because he did and said things that challenged the status quo. He refused to meet their violence with violence, refused to save himself in the way that some of his followers thought that he should with a show of power. And instead, the God of love who came to earth to show us what that love looked like in human form was tortured and put to death on a cross in a violent and humiliating death. But the good news of Good Friday is that his death wasn't the end of the story. The powers of human evil and corruption and sin did the absolute best they could on Good Friday. And still, God's love and grace came out on top. The last thing Jesus did before he died was forgive those who were killing him and the criminals who were killed beside him. His resurrection shows us that even when we do terrible things, when we ignore God's love and even try to drive it from the world, we are forgiven and life triumphs over death. And so today on Good Friday, we mourn. We mourn the loss of Jesus from the world 
and we mourn the continued existence of sin and darkness and hate and greed and systems of power that strike others down. But we also wait, knowing that Good Friday isn't the end of the story, that hate and violence aren't the last word, that God's saving act is still to come, and that we are invited to be a part of the coming resurrection. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take yourselves, take them yourselves, and you judge him according to your law. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So are you a king? You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he said this, Pilate went out to the Jewish authorities and told them, If I find no case against him, I do find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here's the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? <clears throat> but Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From the, then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jew authorities cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. 
Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. What is truth? When Pilate asked Jesus, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus responded by asking, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Ah, so you are a king, said Pilate. Jesus responded by saying, You say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Then Pilate says, What is truth? That was 2,000 years ago, and people struggled with what truth was, like many do today. What is truth? There is cynicism in Pilate's question. Jesus had already told him the truth. How cynical our world is today to matters of faith, even when they know the truth. For today's man, truth is whatever the majority says, subjective truth. Three times Pilate tried to tell the crowds that he found no fault in Jesus, that he was innocent. Maybe Pilate recognized the possibility that Jesus is king of the Jews? But in the end, Pilate must choose to follow either the truth revealed by Christ or choose the way of the world. How do we recognize the truth in our midst? Or do we? Pilate offered to help Jesus get out of this mess, telling Jesus that he had the power to release him and the power to crucify him. Whereas Jesus responded, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Pilate did not recognize that his power came from God. Pilate might have wanted the truth to come out, but he didn't want to be the one to say. Do we recognize where our power comes from? Are we courageous enough to let the truth be made known? When Pilate handed Jesus over to the crowd, he revealed his true position, that he could not recognize the things of God, and he allowed fear and pressure to cave to the crowds. How do we handle fear and pressure? How do we bear witness? And how committed are we when it comes to testifying to the truth? Knowing who we are and whose we are strengthens us to know and to live in the truth. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but the man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures say. They will divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, 
were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full on so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it up to his mouth. After this, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a great day of solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And and again, another passage of the scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jewish authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred weight. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen clothes, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden where he was crucified, and in that garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The true story is the most important story ever told. How do we know? The scriptures tell us so. The Apostle Paul wrote, What I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Everything Jesus said and did in his lifetime was to fulfill the Scriptures which had been written about him. Everything that led up to the death of Jesus on the cross occurred exactly as the prophets had predicted. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He did it for love. Though it caused him great pain and anguish, Jesus went to the cross willingly as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It was our sin that nailed him to the tree. 
All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one so good that we don't need forgiveness. And thankfully, there is no one so bad that we can't be forgiven. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God loved us enough to send his very best and dearest, his one and only son. Jesus died as the king of the Jews, but he was not the Jewish Messiah only. He is the savior of the whole world. That is the reason why the cross appears in churches around the world and is worn by many people as a sign of identification with the one who is crucified for us. Some complain that the cross is a bloody symbol. That is true. It was the cruelest form of punishment the Romans could devise. But for those who believe, the cross is an inspiring symbol. The cross where Jesus shed his lifeblood proves that God was willing to stop at nothing to save us. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God. We call this day Good Friday. And so it is. When we come by faith to the one who died for us, all the wrong things that we have done, when we accept his love and love him in return, we begin the life for which God created us in the first place. We are promised eternal life for believing in him and become part of God's forever family. At the cross, we relinquish our rights to ourselves. I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As he hung on the cross, Jesus said, I am thirsty. We expect Christ to satisfy our spiritual thirst, and he is eager and able to do so. But we should also be concerned to satisfy his thirst, his longing to redeem the souls of women and men. The final words of Jesus before his death were these, it is finished. Everything necessary for our salvation has been completed. Be sure to attend the church of your choice on Easter morning, where you will hear the rest of the story. a place of mercy reigns and never dies there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down 
at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you, and I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I'm in all to you, and I owe all to you. Save my life here I bow down here. 
Join us in Good Friday intercession prayer and feel free to join us on the response, which is, have mercy on your people, Lord. We pray for the whole church, all leaders, ministers, pastors, and all the people of God, that we may bear our cross and follow Jesus. This is our prayer. Have, have mercy, mercy on, on your, your people, people, Lord. We pray for those who have sinned, like Peter. Teach us to be sorry for our sins and forgive us for Jesus' sake. This is our prayer. Have, have mercy, mercy on, on your people, people, Lord. We pray for prisoners and criminals like Barabbas. May they find true freedom by changing the way they live. This is our prayer. Have, have mercy, mercy on, on your, your people, people, Lord. We pray for people in government, like Pilate. May they be responsible and serve truth and justice. This is our prayer. Have, Have mercy, mercy on, on your people, people, Lord. We pray for those who are dying, like the thieves who died with Jesus. May they die with Jesus by their side and be received into your kingdom. This is our prayer. Have, Have mercy, mercy on, on your people, people, Lord. We pray for parents like Mary who have lost a child. May they bear their suffering and know the comfort of your love. This is our prayer. Have, have mercy, mercy on your people, people, Lord. We pray for the whole human race, that we may all come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. This is our prayer. Have, have mercy, mercy on, on your people, people Lord. Lord. Father, may the suffering and death of Jesus lighten the burdens of all those who suffer. Lead us in the way of the cross so that as we suffer with Jesus, we may rise to life in his glory, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As this service ends, we ask that you would please leave the sanctuary quietly. Some may wish to linger in prayer. You may feel free to stay as long as as you wish. And now, receive the benediction. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It is finished.